one, two. Check, check, check.
Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I call the Small Business Committee organizational meeting to order. I want to first welcome all returning and new members. Before we introduce new members, I want to recognize ranking member Steve Shabot, who has served on this committee with me for so many years now. We both know what it's like being in the majority and the minority, and together we have proven just what bipartisanship looks like. Just as Mr. Shabot has done in his tenure as chairman, I intend to continue this committee's history of working together to foster a healthy business climate for America's entrepreneurs. I look forward to working with you and other members of the committee to accomplish this goal. Small businesses continue to make unprecedented contributions to our economy. They create nearly two-thirds of net new jobs and account for nearly half of all private sector employment. But they need our help as they are facing challenges, accessing capital, identifying a skilled workforce, and complying with an overly complex tax code. As we move forward, it is our duty to make sure they are giving all the resources they need to prosper. But to do so, it is important to address these issues in a constructive and inclusive manner. My belief has always been that there is not a Republican or Democratic approach to small businesses. Good ideas come from both sides of the aisle, and we need to encourage that, which is why I will make it a priority to work in a bipartisan fashion. During the last two years, we did just that and accomplished a great deal together. Small businesses deserve our partnership. We have a diverse committee, and that is our strength, because we will ensure our work benefits all entrepreneurs, no matter their location, industry, or background. I look forward to collaborating with the ranking member and with all committee members this Congress. Now, let me take this opportunity to introduce the members on my side. There are a, there are a few new Democratic members of, of the committee. Congressman Marvizi, now in his fourth term, previously served in the Texas House of Representatives. <laughs> and has seen been dedicated to addressing the challenges of many middle-class Americans. We are excited to have his experience. The rest of our new members are from our ambitious crop of freshmen. Avi Finkenauer served in the Iowa House of Representatives before her election to Congress. She has a passion for rural economic development and will be a true asset to our committee. Andy Kim bring extensive foreign affairs experience to Congress after serving at the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, National Security Council, and in Afghanistan as a civilian advisor. Cherise Davids from Kansas bring her knowledge as a businesswoman, lawyer, and professional mixed martial artist. Don't mess around with her. <laughs> Jerry Golden is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, and in 2014, he was elected to the main House of Representatives, where he served as the Democratic Assistant Majority Leader in 2016. Jason Crow is a former Army Ranger and a lawyer who has served multiple tours overseas and earned a Bronze Star for his combat actions. As the son of small business owners, he understands the hard work our nation's job creators put into creating jobs and growing our economy. Thank you for your service. Antonio Delgado hails from my home state of New York. He's a Rhodes Scholar with diverse professional experience that includes working in the music industry and as a lawyer where he dedicated significant pro bono work fighting for criminal justice reform. Chrissy Hulahan, like many of our colleagues, also served 
our country before being elected to Congress. She served in the Air Force, but also brings her background as an engineer and entrepreneur to her work here on the committee. We welcome you all to Congress and are excited you will be serving on the House Small Business Committee. I would also like to welcome back the members who serve on the committee in the 115th Congress. Judy Chu is in her sixth term in Congress and fifth with the committee. She has a PhD in psychology and also served in the California State Assembly. Joining us from Pennsylvania is Dwight Evans, who previously served as the ranking member of our subcommittee on economic growth, tax, and capital access. We're very lucky to have him back in his new position as the committee's vice chair. His dedication to small business issue is clear, as he has served for over 35 years in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives before coming to Congress. Mr. Schneider is in his third term serving on this committee where his over two decades in business and management consulting has helped him address the needs of small businesses as they hire and grow their businesses. Last but not least, Adriano Espaillat, also from the great state of New York, is rejoining the committee for his second term. Originally born in the Dominican Republic, he's the first Dominican American to serve in Congress. We are very fortunate to have you all back on this committee. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Shabot, for his opening statement and to introduce his new members. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, and as we begin, I want to uh, mention, as you did, that uh, 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 Chairman Velasquez and I have uh, served on this committee for uh, over 20 years uh, together, 23 to be exact, but who's counting? Uh, and we both held the position of chair and both ranking member, uh, depending on which party uh, controlled the House. Um, we have worked together in a very bipartisan manner uh, at nearly every step of the way, and I want to thank her for continuing this uh, tradition, uh, at least so far, uh, in the 116th Congress, although we're not very far in it yet, but I'm sure we're going to continue those bipartisan uh, efforts. For new members of Congress, I'm uh, sure that a lot of you have uh, seen committee hearings on TV or on the Internet that have been filled with rancor and bitter uh, partisanship, and uh, that could give a preconceived notion of how things work around here. But uh, let me assure you that while uh, you may find that in other committees uh, uh, that you sit on, you will not find it here, at least uh, not usually. Of course, uh, there will be philosophical uh, differences. We have real differences on on health care and taxes and a whole, whole range of issues. But uh, on this committee, we do truly work together across the aisle for the betterment of America's uh, small businesses. Um, we do this because small businesses are the key to our economy. Uh, we must ensure that small companies are healthy uh, so they can create jobs and continue to grow. Policies that expand capital access, create new incentives, and spur investment will continue that economic expansion. Small businesses employ over half of America's workers and create about 70 percent of Americans, uh, uh, the new jobs in the American economy. They represent approximately 99 percent. Uh, so 99 out of 100 businesses uh, in America are, by definition, small businesses. They comprise about uh, half of the nation's private sector payroll and produce about half of our private non-farm gross domestic product. Uh, the past two years have brought great news for small firms. Optimism continues to push all-time highs. Small firms are investing more capital into their businesses. Wage growth for employees at small firms continues to grow, and profits are up. But as with everything, uh, we can always fine-tune uh, the engine to get a better performance. I look forward to working with you, Madam Chairwoman, and the other members of the committee on both sides of the aisle uh, over the next uh, two years. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our new members, uh, uh, the new Republican members of the Small Business Committee. I'll begin with Representative uh, Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma, who started his first uh, small business in 1985, specializing in computer and software applications. Then he started saving to purchase his first McDonald's restaurant, uh, starting several small business ventures along the way, uh, writing computer programs to automate tasks for other businesses, uh, real estate, and even hog farming. And we welcome him here. Uh, Representative Jim Hagedorn of Minnesota started his career 
as a congressional staffer for Minnesota Congressman Arland Strangeland here in Washington, D.C. Later, he worked as director for legislative and public affairs for the Financial Management Service, the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and in the congressional affairs shop for the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Representative uh, Pete Stauber of uh, Minnesota began his career as a police officer in the early 1990s. He served both as the president of the Law Enforcement Labor Services Union, Local 363, and as an area commander with the Duluth uh, Police Department. Uh, he later uh, became a city councilman and county commissioner, and he's a heck of a hockey player uh, as well, uh, both at the college level, being national championships, and uh, in the uh, pros as well. Um, Representative uh, Tim Burchett of Tennessee founded a, a small business uh, early in his life. Uh, he then dedicated himself uh, to public service, uh, serving in the Tennessee State House, Senate, and most recently as mayor of Knox County, uh, Tennessee. And we welcome him as well. Uh, Representative Ross Spano of Florida spent most of his career as a shareholder of his own law practice, representing individuals and small businesses in Hillsborough County. In 2012, he successfully won a seat in Florida's House of Representatives, where he served for three terms. Representative John Joyce of Pennsylvania is a physician who began his medical career working with the Navy at Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Virginia during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. He returned to his hometown to open his own practice and has been caring for central Pennsylvanians uh, uh, ever since. And we welcome uh, all our new members, and this committee considers many issues that are related to our nation's economy, so I know the knowledge and expertise of our new members will be extremely helpful. Uh, we welcome all of you to the committee. I also want to recognize the Republican members who are returning to the committee, uh, Amata Radawagon of American Samoa, who will serve as our vice-ranking member for the 116th uh, Congress, and Trent Kelly of Mississippi and Troy Balverson of Ohio. Each of them has made significant contributions uh, to our committee's consideration of policy, and I know that their experience will be invaluable as we contemplate the critical issues facing our nation's small businesses. So, Madam Chairwoman, I look forward to another two productive years working with you and working on policies that will help America's entrepreneurs uh, succeed, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and I look forward uh, to the discussion and debates uh, that I know will transpire over the next two years. And now we will move to the rules package. With the adoption of today's rules package, I believe we are making it clear to the small business community that we are committed to working together and advocating on their behalf. Pursuant to Clause 2A of House Rule 11, today's first order of business is to adopt the committee rules for the 116th Congress. The adoption of the rules is central to the work we do and the tone we set in this body. Perhaps most importantly, they must ensure that all points of view are considered and that the minority retains their full rights to be heard. In this context, the rules remain largely unchanged from the 115th Congress. The rules have been modified slightly to conform with House rules adopted last month. That change clarifies that weekends and holidays, when the House is not in session, are not counted for purposes of the three days noted rule for markups. Hearings are one of our best platforms and offer tremendous insight, and we welcome non-committee members to participate. Our rules now make it clear that they're welcome to attend our hearings with appro appropriate notice and to question witnesses with the approval of the chair and ranking member. However, they cannot be counted for purposes of a quorum or to participate in any vote. The rules package also institutes a long-standing practice of the committee to extend the five-minute oral testimony of a witness as long as the chair and ranking member agree. Finally, the rules rename three of our subcommittees, which reflects the changing nature of small business challenges. The new subcommittees are the Subcommittee on Contracting and Infrastructure, formerly Contracting and Workforce, the Subcommittee on Innovation and Workforce Development, formerly Health and Technology, and the Subcommittee on Rural Development, Agricultural Trade and Entrepreneurship formerly agriculture, energy, and trade. This committee needs to run in a cooperative manner. I believe the best way to do 
That is to make sure both sides have an equal voice and are treated in a way that is fair. Through adoption of these rules, we will continue this practice. I would like to thank the staff on both sides for working closely on the rules package. Thank you. At this point, I would like to yield the ranking member Shabbat for any comments he may have on the rules. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I want to thank you and your staff for working uh, so collaboratively on the committee rules package. Um, this package provides continued protection uh, for the rights of the minority, now that we're in the minority and had those same protections for the, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle when they were in the minority, uh, and the opportunity for minorities' uh, input into the operation of the committee. I want to take a moment to highlight just several rules, and you've already mentioned these, but um, the first, uh, the minority will continue to have control of uh, uh, fully a third of the committee's budget. This rule goes a long way toward maintaining the collegial tone of the committee. Uh, second, witnesses, as you mentioned, will uh, limit their oral presentation to, to five minutes uh, of uh, written testimony. Uh, they can summarize it, of course, which has been the committee's rule in the past. Uh, in the new rules, uh, the chairwoman in consultation with a ranking member I may now extend that time uh, if we think that that would be uh, helpful for the committee. Uh, finally, members of the committee uh, who are not members of the Committee on Small Business occasionally uh, join the committee to participate in a hearing. Uh, these members are not permitted to vote for the purpose of establishing a quorum or on any matter, but in the proposed rules may question witnesses if permitted by the chair in consultation with the ranking member. Uh, and we support those, uh, those efforts and those changes. Again, I appreciate the chairwoman and her staff for working closely with the minority and bringing this rules package forward, and I urge my colleagues to support it. Uh, and I yield back to balance my time. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. Are there any members that wish to be recognized on the rules? The committee now moves to consideration of the rules package. The clerk will read the title of the document. I ask unanimous consent that the rules package be considered as read and open for amendment in its entirety. Does any member seek recognition for the purposes of offering an amendment? Seeing none, no amendments, the question is on adopting the rules. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the proposed rules are adopted, and staff is authorized to make technical and grammatical changes. Pursuant to House rule, the rules adopted by the Committee on Small Business for the 116th Congress will be published in the congressional record and made available to members and the public on the committee's website. Now we will approve our subcommittee chairs and ranking members. The full committee vice chair will be Representative Dwight Evans, who was elected by a vote of the Democratic Caucus. Representative Jer Jerry Golden will be the chair of the subcommittee on contracting and infrastructure. Representative Andy Kim will be chair of the subcommittee on economic growth, tax, and capital access. Representative Jason Crow will be the chair on the subcommittee on innovation and workforce development. Representative Judy Chu will be chair on the subcommittee on investigation, oversight, and regulations. And Representative Abby Finkenauer will be the chair on the subcommittee on rural development, agricultural, trade, and entrepreneurship. And now I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for any remarks that he may have to introduce the subcommittee ranking members. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I'll now introduce the subcommittee ranking members for the Republican side uh, of the committee. Uh, Representative uh, John Joyce, and if you, if I wouldn't mind if the members could kind of just raise their hands so everybody knows who they are. Uh, Representative John Joyce from Pennsylvania will be the ranking member for the Subcommittee on Rural Development, uh, Entrepreneurship, and Trade. Representative Troy Balderson of Ohio will be the ranking member for the Subcommittee on Innovation and Workforce uh, Development. Representative Kevin Hearn from Oklahoma will be the ranking member for the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Tax, and Capital Access. Representative Ross Spano from Florida will be the ranking member for the Subcommittee on Investigations, Oversight, and Regulations. And Representative Pete Stauber from Minnesota will be the ranking member for the Subcommittee on Contracting and Infrastructure. We have an excellent crop of uh, new newcomers on the committee uh, on our side, uh, and I, I know that the, uh, uh, the folks on the other side of the aisle are, are pretty good too. Um, and uh, and these folks will be going along with the really fantastic members that are already uh, uh, on the committee, so we appreciate them uh, being here. And uh, look forward to working uh, with the uh, 
our colleagues on the other side of the aisle in the 160th uh, Congress. And uh, as, as we've already indicated, we, we actually accomplish a lot in a bipartisan manner on, on this committee, and we appreciate that. And I now yield back. Thank you. I move that the list of subcommittee chairs and ranking members and vice chair as set forth in the roster be approved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the chairs and ranking members are appointed. This concludes the order of business for today's meeting. Does any member seek recognition for debate before we conclude? If not, without a... Yes. I'm Tim Burchett. I'm a new member. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm breaking protocol here, but I, I saw in the news where you... Um, you stepped up and did the right thing, I saw, in your district where there was, a, I believe, a jail without, without heat. And uh, as a county mayor, I know that a lot of people in our jails are not guilty. And a lot of people in Knox County maybe don't speak the language or just caught in a bad situation financially. And I wanted to thank you for looking out the least amongst us. I can't imagine anything more horrible than being in a jail or knowing that your loved ones were in there and didn't have heat or anything during horrible weather conditions. So thank I wanted to thank, thank you. Thank you so and, much. And if that cost me votes in Knox County, so be it. But yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. My guess really is it won't. It. <laughs> it won't. Really appreciate it. Uh, any other member who wish to make any um, comment or ask any questions? If not, without objection, this meeting of the Committee on Small Business stands adjourned and the committee will stand in, rest, in recess for a few moments to prepare for a committee hearing. Thank you. Thank you all. See, you're already getting praise from our side. Yeah. Oh, my God. Really? It's okay. Thank you. You ask me what I think is going to happen, not what I think should happen. Right? What should happen is we have to get something in the middle. We have to let the dreamers stay, and we have to, you know, do the. Congratulations on uh, winning, winning your seat and everything. Thank you. So, Thank you. Yeah. you take care. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, she's here. She, okay. She's right over here. Oh, okay. Good morning. The committee will come to order.
We thank everyone for joining us this morning, and I want to especially thank the witnesses for being here today. As we are all aware, the recent government shutdown was a particularly painful experience that will leave a lasting impact on small business economy and our workforce. For many federal workers, contractors, and small business owners, it was 35 days of missed paychecks, delayed loans, and strained budgets. Most unsettling to many of us was the sheer uncertainty of just how long this will last. Despite the shutdown ending, many small business owners and workers are still feeling its effect. While those direct and indirect costs are being tallied, there are some things that we already know. We know that $3 billion in economic activity has been permanently lost, according to the latest Congressional Budget Office figures. We also know that federal contractors and workers, many of whom live paycheck to paycheck, had to take extraordinary measures to make ends meet. We know that the shutdown delayed $18 billion in federal discretionary spending and shuttered numerous federal agencies, including the Small Business Administration. Because of the shutdown, SBA was forced to suspend many of its most crucial services, including the approval of small business loan and contractor certifications. During the shutdown, we heard one heartbreaking story after another. From small businesses who have lost customers and other waiting on SBA loans to small contractors who aren't getting paid, the impact was felt by many. But what we don't know is the shutdown's full cost to the small business community. Today's hearing gives us the opportunity to answer this question. We will hear from a flourishing brewery that has had to postpone the rollout of 26 19 beers due to a lack of federal approval. We will also be hearing from a federal contractor that has to take extraordinary measures to ensure her employees were supported through this difficult time. These stories, along with many more, will give us insight into how small businesses, their employees, and local economies weathered this terrible storm. It is my hope that we can shed light on the difficulties entrepreneurs and federal workers alike are still enduring after the shutdown. It is my hope that lawmakers can come together to prevent another one in the future because the consequences are far too real for our nation's job creators. I look forward to today's hearing and thank the witnesses for being here to share their stories with us. I now would like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Schaberfer, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The uh, partial government shutdown left many small businesses in a state of uncertainty. And it's important that we address how quickly we can bring the small business economy back up to speed. Many American small businesses utilize services from the federal government, and of particular interest to this committee, they often turn to the SBA, the Small Business Administration. The SBA provides small businesses with many different types of assistance, including aid in competing for government contracts, gaining access to capital, and entrepreneurial development. Unfortunately, during this winter's partial government closure, the majority of the SBA employees, with the exception of the Office of Disaster Assistance, were furloughed. The tempor this uh, temporarily halted the SBA's lending programs and left many small business contractors without pay. Many small businesses around the country also saw a drop in consumer spending, especially those most frequented by government employees. Yet, even in the most trying of times, I'm always encouraged by the determination of America's entrepreneurs. Uh, despite the dysfunction in Washington, small businesses started off 2019 strong. According to the National Federation of Independent Businesses, NFIB, uh, small firms added workers realizing the best rate gain since last July. 
Wages also rose in January with the percentage of business owners reporting that they increased employee compensation, and it continued at 45-year record highs. This welcome news, however, does not mean that small businesses came out unscathed. Many small businesses' bottom lines were influenced by the government's closure and obviously adversely. Now that the federal government has reopened, many small businesses are wondering what's next. Today, I hope we will be able to provide clarity to any small business affected by the shutdown. While government shutdowns often prompt people and politicians alike to assign blame, I hope that today we can put those differences aside and have a productive conversation to help our nation's small businesses get back on track so they can continue to prosper, innovate, and expand and hire folks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. And if committee members have an opening statement prepared, we would ask that they be submitted for the record. I would like just to take a few minutes to explain the timing rules. Each witness gets five minutes to testify, and each member gets five minutes for questioning. There is a lighting system to assist you. The green light will be on when you begin, and the yellow light will come on when you have one minute remaining. The red light will come on when you are out of time, and we ask that you stay within the time frame to the best of your ability. I would, love, uh, I would like now to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Matthew Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro is the Lawrence Klein Collegiate Professor of Economics at the University of Michigan. He is editor of the American Economic Journal, Economic Policy. Dr. Shapiro is also the chair of the Federal Economic Statistic Advisory Committee, the official <coughs> advisory committee of the Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Welcome, sir. Our second witness is Mr. Bill Butch Butcher. Mr. Butcher is the founder of Port City Brewing Company, an artisanal craft brewery in Alexandria, Virginia. He is a fourth generation Alexandrian and as a longtime craft beer aficionado. He watched the craft beer business evolve and become more like the fine wine business. It was this evolution that convinced him and his wife, Karen, to start Port City Brewing Company in Alexandria in 2011. Welcome. Our third witness today is Mr. Heidi Gurdon, Ms. Heidi Gurdon. Ms. Gurdon, the CEO and co-founder of High Tech Services, a woman and service disabled veteran-owned business. High Tech Services is a federal programs and technology solutions provider headquartered in Landover, Maryland. She is the first woman from Minnesota to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy. Ms. Gurdon's neighbor career spanned nearly 10 years, during a time when being an academy graduate, a naval officer, and a woman challenge established tradition. Welcome, Ms. Gurdon, and thank you for your service. I will, now, I, will now, I will now like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, to introduce our final witness. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Our final witness today is Mr. Charles T. Rowe, President and CEO of America's Small Business Development Centers, a nationwide network of 975 centers providing no-cost business counseling and training to small business owners. Prior to this role, Mr. Rowe served as the Associate Administrator with Congressional Legislative Affairs for the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and also served on the House Small Business Committee, this committee, as counsel for 10 years. Welcome back to the committee, Mr. Rowe, and we thank you for your testifying today, and we thank all the witnesses, and Ms. Gerding, thank you for your, uh, your service. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shabbat. And now um, I uh, recognize Dr. Shapiro for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, and other members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to thank you for the opportunity to testify about the effects of the recent partial government shutdown. The recent government shutdown had an immediate and direct effect on government workers and contractors who were not paid during the shutdown and businesses who therefore lost sales. Research on the 2013 shutdown had an uh, provides concrete evidence on how government workers cope with a drop in pay and provides insights into how the direct effects of lost pay affect the economy in general 
and small business in particular. Many households live paycheck to paycheck. A typical government worker has about a week's worth of spending in the bank prior to the 2013 shutdown. Roughly 20% only had one day's worth of spending in the bank prior to the shutdown. Hence, many government workers needed to take multiple steps to make payments and meet expenses when they go payless. In October 2013, government workers took a number of measures. On average, they cut overall spending by an amount equal to about half the pay shortfall. Households with low cash buffer cut spending more sharply. Many deferred payments, including mortgage, rent, and credit card payments. There is little evidence, however, that workers affected by the 2013 government shutdown borrowed by incurring new charges on their credit cards. Those who have little cash and substantial credit card debt appeared very reluctant to accumulate new debt in the face of the drop in income. Because the 2013 shutdown was resolved quickly and workers were paid promptly, it had little lasting effect on workers' financial conditions or on the overall economy. Workers who deferred mortgage payments or rent were able to make payments once they received retroactive pay, often within the month, so there was no discernible effect on their credit. While the coping strategies of affected workers in the recent shutdown appear similar to that in 2013, the severity of the shutdown for affected workers led to much greater economic impacts. Few households have sufficient cash buffers to offset a month with no pay. As the shutdown entered its fifth week last month, they, there was considerable risk of a sharp drop in economic activity. The out-of-pocket uh, costs of coming to work, commuting costs, or childcare expenses are significant and needed to be paid even by those government workers who are mandated to work. The temporary expedient of skipping a, a payment of rent, of mortgage, of credit card, of cell phone, of utilities, of insurance, of doctor's bills, you name it, uh, something that might have seemed at first fairly low risk given the short duration of previous shutdowns was a looming financial disaster for many households. Disruptions of federal services, particularly air transportation, were becoming widespread. Small businesses served many consumer needs for discretionary purchases. Examples include restaurants and coffee shops, dry cleaners, corner grocery stores, parking lots, movie theaters, or car dealerships. When households have to make cutbacks, they focus on discretionary purchases, such as eating out, or big ticket items that can be deferred, such as a car or appliance purchase. Businesses and locations where federal workers and contractors live or work were disproportionately affected. Workers deferring their payments also affects business. Some of these payments, mortgage, credit cards, utility, phone bills, were paid to large institutions who presumably had a buffer. In contrast, late rent payments may go to small landlords who themselves owe payments to creditors and to the small businesses who service their properties. The shutdown may have placed such businesses under stress, which could have been severe had the shutdown continued into a second cycle of monthly payments. There are other effects, much harder to quantify, but equally important, from having the federal government operating partially for five weeks. Those doing business with the government, those awaiting regulatory approvals, those awaiting loan approvals, or just trying to get information are put on hold. They face continuing delays as the affected agencies clear the backlogs associated with the five-week closure. These disruptions appear likely have a cumulative and persistent effect on business output and pro productivity. Perhaps the silver lining from the recent shutdown is the widespread disruptions it caused made salient the many federal functions that provide vital services to business and the public. Further estimates on the effect of the shutdown are available from official statistics, macroeconomic models, and the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey. I provide some details in my written testimony. Thank you for asking me to testify for the committee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for being uh, on time. Uh, I really appreciate it. And now we will recognize uh, Mr. Butcher for five minutes. Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Chabot, and members of the committee, thank you for asking me to testify today. I look forward to speaking on behalf of the small and independent brewers about the impact of the partial government shutdown. <clears throat> My name is Bill Butcher. I'm the founder of Port City Brewing Company in Alexandria, Virginia. 
Port City began operations in 2011, and since then we've grown to have 56 employees. We brew a variety of different beers with a number of year-round staples, seasonal beers, as well as one-offs. In 2015, we were named Small Brewery of the Year, and our beers have won local, national, and international awards. I invite all of you and your staff to come visit Port City anytime and see how our brewery is run. Port City is committed to being a local and independent brewery. For example, we purchase close to 400,000 pounds of Virginia-grown wheat to use in our Optimal Wit, which is our best-selling beer. We're proud of our work with our supply chain partners in manufacturing, agriculture, and retail, and the jobs we've helped to create. According to the Brewers Association, which is the trade association that represents small and independent brewers, breweries like ours contributed $76.2 billion to the U.S. economy in 2017, and we employ more than 135,000 Americans in manufacturing and service jobs. Running a brewery is capital and time intensive. As a small business, we rely on planning to make sure that we can operate our brewery, meet our suppliers' needs, and pay our employees. We know that unexpected issues can arise, and we do everything we can to prevent them, to prepare for them. Unfortunately, no one could prepare for the impact of the partial government shutdown would have on breweries. Two major agencies that we rely on to run our businesses were closed during the shutdown. The Alcohol, Toba Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, also known as the TTB, and the Small Business Administration, or the SBA. One of the TTB's main functions is to process certificate of label approvals, also known as COLAs, which breweries are required to have if we package our beer and sell it across state lines. <clears throat> Some states also require COLAs for all beer packaged and sold in state. Without a label approval, we cannot sell our beer. You may be surprised to hear that as an industry, we get along with our regulators. Over the past few years, the TTB has taken steps to increase efficiency and, and turnaround time of approvals. Last year, they approved more than 34,000 malt beverage labels. Prior to the shutdown, the turnaround time on malt beverage label approvals was between six and 30 days. As of February 1st, the TTB estimated a 53-day approval time and was only processing labels that were submitted last December 13th. The backlog is not the fault of the TTB, the employees who process labels, formulas, and brewer's notices are deemed non-essential. They were prohibited from reporting to work during the shutdown. To give you an idea of how this hurts a brewery, I'll use Port City as an example. We spent months putting together a release calendar for our 2019 beers to help us determine when we will purchase ingredients and packaging supplies. On December 18th, we submitted a label for a beer that we are planning to release in the spring. Until we get that approval, we can't sell that beer, and the entire supply chain is on hold. The uncertainty isn't just impacting my business, it's impacting everyone I do business with. We're just one of the thousands of businesses who are dealing with these repercussions. We're asking that the TTB employees be declared essential. To our business and thousands of others, they are just that. If you empower a federal agency to give approvals for basic business activities, you need to keep them at work. Unfortunately, time is of the essence. The upcoming deadline for funding the government has brewers throughout the country <clears throat> uh, nervous about another shutdown and its long-term impacts on their business. Port City was also hurt by the furloughing of SBA staff who were working on a loan application uh, for our new bottling line. We've been unable to lock down an interest rate and I will likely have to pay thousands more over the life of the loan in interest. Last year, the SBA provided $1.4 billion in loans to more than 1,900 small breweries. I can attest firsthand to the importance of those loans. We ask that the SBA employees who approve federally backed loans also be declared essential. Congress can also help mitigate the effects of the shutdown by making the federal excise tax rates from the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act permanent. In 2018, breweries, wineries, and distilleries across the U.S. have hired new employees increased their economic development, and made capital improvements to their businesses. Making the lower rate permanent in 2019 will allow breweries to continue doing these things and to help cover any losses that resulted from the government shutdown. In conclusion, my company and other breweries need reliable federal partners to continue to grow. We can't sell our product without them. I ask that in the future you work to get TTB and SBA employees declared essential. Thank you again for having me here, and I look forward to any questions you may have. 
Thank you, Mr. Butcher. And uh, now um, Ms. Gardin is recognized for five minutes. So thank everyone. Um, I want to start, first of all, by thanking Ms. Valesquez and Mr. Shabout for having us here today. Um, also, the veterans that are serving on the uh, as congressman today, thank you very much for your service as well. Nothing is more important to me. I also serve on um, a board of directors for National Veterans Small Business Coalition and very near and dear to my heart still. Um, I have in my testimony that you have in front of you, um, it was interesting, my son read it and said, Mom, this sounds more like a proposal for the government than it does testimony. So you'll see exhibits and attachments and all sorts of fun things in there. Um, it's, it's based into four areas, background, impact, I summarize, and then the call to action. My testimony is a very personal testimony. It doesn't have a lot of statistics in there about small business and things. This is an impact to my business directly. We are, High Tech Services is a government contractor. The one thing I'll say is that we really recognize, spent a lot of time recognizing the federal workforce. No time whatsoever was spent recognizing the government contractors that support those agencies. Our people were not allowed to go into food banks and get food, yet they were without pay for a number of weeks. My company, fortunately, after two weeks of no pay, for 36 employees of about 160 billable staff that I had working, so it's about 22.5% of my billable workforce, were without pay for two weeks. The company asked them to take vacation, personal time, or leave without pay. Normally, we don't allow our people to take leave without pay. We ask them to expend their vacation and personal time. But due to the circumstances, knowing that a couple of our employees were getting married and had plans, needed to save their leave and things like that, we had other members that were pregnant, and they knew that maternity leave was coming up. They had plans for their vacation. So they went without pay for two weeks. After two weeks, my staff got together and said, you know what? I couldn't do this as an owner of a business. This is ridiculous. So at the third week, we put our employees back on the payroll at our erosion of profits to keep those people. When you consider the time and the effort it takes to recruit a new person to fulfill a government contract, which our costs are about $1,100 per new person, that does not include the time to get them through a national agency clearance investigation, an ACI check, which can range from three to eight weeks once we identify and get an offer letter back from employee accepting employment. They then go through three to eight weeks waiting for the government to say yes, they can start work. If, in the worst case scenario, an agency takes eight weeks to approve that person to start on the job, and it comes back denied because they found something that I didn't pick up in my background, Chuck, that maybe they had access to FBI records or something that my background people don't have access to, the whole process starts again. So we have staff that are performing work extra because of vacancies that are currently existing on contracts. When I talked about the impact, I, I labeled into three areas, financial impact on the employees, the financial impact on the company, and then the emotional toll it took on both sides of the house, which are, uh, un I mean, they're just unbearable to even think about. Probably the biggest thing was the employees that were not affected, were still working for the FDA, were concerned that the FDA might run out of money and would they be furloughed? What would happen then? The only relief came when they heard that the company put, after three weeks, everybody back on the payroll. It did provide some relief, but there was a lot of anxiety associated with that. When people are worried about things, they don't perform at their top, at their per top performance level. Our company processes paper and electronic forms for the federal government. Our work is considered mission critical. At the Food and Drug Administration, we're processing medical device applications for approval. We're also processing the adverse events that come from a result of a malfunction, serious injury, or death of a malfunction. Those are mission critical services, and they're usually fee-based. So those employees continued to work. One employee gave me um, an acknowledgment that we take a lot of from importers overseas, Calling the FDA and asking us questions about registering things was an embarrassment, he said, to have them have to explain to foreign countries or foreign companies that our country was shut down in that particular area and couldn't process something. It was unfathomable to another country that this country couldn't do something. So I want to summarize things, although please take time to read my testimony. I personally wrote this testimony because it was from the heart. I saw what my employees went through. I know what I would have gone through. But I wrapped it up with three calls to action. The first one is please, please fund these last seven agencies and departments. Do not have my employees have to go through this again next week. The next thing is to treat 
do not forget about the government contractors. There are so many government contractors that outnumber federal employees. Don't forget about us. The analogy that I use in there is when the Vietnam War era, veteran era, era people came back from the war, they were, they were not treated respectfully. And as a result of that, Today, our veterans are coming back and being respected. Don't make this analogous to that situation. Have us be those returning war veterans and treat us with the same amount of respect. And finally, something that I just became aware of myself was the debt ceiling that's looming on March the 2nd. Please don't lose sight of that. The economic impact to my business and me personally as a mother is, is, is unconscionable. So please do not forget about the debt ceiling and do a bipartisan piece of legislation and vote for extraordinary measures to get that through. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garden. And now I recognize uh, Mr. Roll for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, members of the committee. I'm the president of America's SBDC, the association that represents the nationwide Small Business Development Center system. For 40 years, SPDCs have been assisting small business owners and aspiring entrepreneurs. So what was the effect of the shutdown? Well, luckily, SPDCs were able to carry on. Our host institutions have the flexibility to support us for a short period. Some networks were forced to suspend advisors and reduce hours, but it was really our clients who bore the brunt of the shutdown's impact. Our federal contracting clients had to suspend work. SBDCs started fielding calls and questions from them right away. Small contractors are often the most affected by a shutdown. Procedures go into place, notices go out, and sometimes there are more questions than answers. A large contractor can shift employees, sort out disruptions, absorb some overhead. But for a small business, the owner and the employees are hanging out there together, and key employees can actually be lost to a better opportunity. There were 41,000 small business contractors affected. One SBDC client supporting the FAA, FAA employs 75 people, and 90% of those employees were furloughed. Their contract is back now. They weathered this shutdown, but they're uncertain about what will happen if there's another one. And when a small business contractor gets furloughed, there's no recouping lost revenue. And it isn't just the existing contracts. An SPDC client was awaiting 8A certification. Without that and letters of support from the local federal lab, which was closed, they couldn't go to an Air Force pitch day. So time was lost and opportunities that will never come back. SPDCs also have thousands of clients seeking financing. And when SBA shuts down, 7A and 504 lending stops. A Lynchburg, Virginia borrower was awaiting SBA approval so he could move to a permanent location. He'd given up his long-term lease expecting that approval. Now he's waiting, worried that his landlord might evict him if he finds a long-term lessee. In Twin Falls, Idaho, the SBDC works closely with a local 504 lender. $11 million of financing was halted. In Twin Falls, that's a lot of money. Another 800000 there was stopped when a lender funding a remodel couldn't get a simple subordination. Until SBA reopened, clients couldn't do simple things like that or get approval for a life insurance payout to a widow whose spouse was her business partner. It happened all over. A child care center in North Carolina waiting for a decision from SBA may cost the business they're building. In Illinois, an 80-year-old design and engineering company may close because their loan wasn't funded by the closing date of December 27th. SBDCs have a partnership with the International Franchise Association. They told us that roughly $12 million a day in SBA-backed loans were being delayed for franchises. Now, SBA is working to clear the backlog, but in the meantime, Small businesses are trying to figure out bridge loans and alternatives. Hopefully, they'll come to us to work it out. Otherwise, desperation can lead to poor business choices, uh, something I know the chairwoman has worked on, and we, we really support her bill on that. As I mentioned above, 8A certifications were suspended. So were mentor-protege agreements. So a small business trying to get approved to team with a large contractor is put on hold. 
And if it's a defense contractor, they're still working, but the small business can't. And business stopped at the Department of Commerce. Export.gov was shut down. SBDC clients are okay because we have certified export counselors, but any small business looking for help on export regulations on their own was stuck. SPDCs are providing all the help we can to keep our clients in the black and help any new small business clients. The DC SBDC is co-sponsoring an event with Intuit bringing in advisors to help contractors <laughs> and hosting a meet and greet for a DC restaurant that felt the pinch too. It's really more than anything a morale boost because many of them are wondering what will happen come February 15th. Our mission is to help them and prepare them for the future. Small business hates uncertainty, and that's exactly what a shutdown is. They aren't bad business people. They didn't make mistakes. They just got caught up in the shutdown. Thank you. I look forward to answering any questions. Let me take this opportunity to thank all the witnesses for sharing your stories. And, uh, you know, sometimes here in Washington, we lose uh, perspective into the incredible long-lasting impact that a government shutdown will cause, not only to federal workers, but those who really keep this economy growing. So I would like to um, uh, recognize myself for five minutes, and I will start by asking Ms. Uh, Dr. Shapiro the first question. The CBO projects a reduced level of GDP for this first quarter, nearly $8 billion lower than expected. Even the Wall Street Journal has also reported small businesses have become more cautious in their expenditures. What could another prolonged shutdown possibly mean for the economy, consumer confidence, workers, and spending? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, as the last witness said, uncertainty is, makes planning very difficult, and that's true for both businesses and households. So even the the threat of a shutdown is presumably slowing down activity this month as workers try to build up uh, cash balances and, and businesses are uncertain whether they should hire or uh, buy a piece of equipment. So I, I think we're even having effects now, so uh, resolving the uncertainty would be very important. At the University of Michigan, we have a consumer sentiment survey, which asks, uh, this is uh, a random sample across the country of, of households asking how, how is the economy going to do. That fell between 7 and 8 percent, a very significant drop in January, and a number of respondents mentioned the shutdown. And these were folks who were not necessarily directly affected but concerned about the economy overall. So, uh, so I find the CBO estimates highly credible, but those are based on, uh, on previous, previous shutdowns where, where the resolution was fairly quick, uh, and the uncertainty was resolved. If, if this drags on, I would, I would expect they might have to update their estimates and, and have a, a bigger effect. And if this sharp uh, decline in consumer and business confidence or sentiment were to continue, could this lead to an economic slowdown this year? Uh, that, that's, that, that's potentially the case. I think the, 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 uh, the, uh, the part of the government that's uh, directly affected is, is small enough that it alone uh, wouldn't uh, lead to a recession. But I think there's a concern that overall confidence that the government isn't functioning, that ordinary, uh, ordinary decisions aren't being made uh, would affect confidence overall and have very dramatic spillovers. And uh, re rece recessions are hard to predict. Uh, uh, the economy is quite resilient, but it's a possible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Butcher, how much of a delay would you say uh, this unexpected interruption has cost you? in time and money. I know that you put some planning into the uh, rollout for the 2019 uh, beer uh, rollout. So if there's any way for you to quantify that. Yeah, we spent the last four months of 2018 uh, planning for 2019 and introducing new beers to the market. The craft beer business growth is driven by innovation, by releasing new beers. Craft beer drinkers are always looking for something new. Our restaurant customers are always looking for something new. And our, when we submit the label, it should take about 14 days to get approved. And so the labels that we have caught up in the backlog at the TTB are beers that we plan on releasing next month as well as uh, the month following. So March and April and May. Um, 
And what that does for us is it just, if, if we can't sell our new beers in the market, uh, those beers just don't get purchased. We can't make that up. People going out to eat or buying beer in a store, they're going to buy something else. And that, effect, that effectively slows down our business. It also, when we look at our suppliers, uh, we buy a significant amount of wheat from Heathsville, from a farm in Heathsville, Virginia, and we contract that wheat. And if we aren't going to buy it when we say we're going to buy it, it slows their small business down as well. And then they need to figure out what they're going to do with that excess wheat. Do they send it to the maltster or do they have to sell it as animal feed or, um, or do they just not get to sell that grain? So it really affects us up the supply stream as well as down the supply stream with restaurants uh, that are slow as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gurdin, you said that, uh, as you said, small contractors and their workers are the silent victims of the shutdown. It seems their plight is a hard one to get uh, hard numbers on as we are gathering anecdotal stories from the press and those who reach out to us. So I would really like to hear your thoughts on whether you are worried about the potential for negative past performance ratings caused by the shutdown and how could that could impede your ability to win future contracts? So the answer to that question is the potential is certainly there. I think today all of our customers completely understand the shutdown and are giving us a pass, if you will, for deliverables and timeliness and um, things that they measure our performance on. My concern is a month or two from now, that'll have been forgotten about, the shutdown. And they'll want to know why we weren't able to recover, why we weren't able to catch up. Um, so today I'm okay, but I am worried about past performance down the pike. I'm still gathering information from my project managers in the field as to any backlogs that may have resulted and how that may impact our performance in the future. But, you know, past performance is key to winning contracts. And if it's, if it's marred in any way, it will hinder my ability to grow the business. Thank you. My time has now expired. The ranking member, Mr. Shabot, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, before I ask questions, just, you know, kind of a, a point here. I think all the witnesses have indicated why we want to avoid uh, an, another shutdown occurring in the very near future because it's impacting, these things impact uh, the economy, they impact real people in many ways, especially as you mentioned, Ms. Ms. Gerding. Um, and, it, and it ought to happen in Congress. Uh, the president ought not to have to take, uh, you know, emergency action of, of any sort. Uh, so, you know, it seems to me that there's somewhere between 5.7 uh, billion for border security and zero that we in good faith when we deal with trillions of dollars uh, every year we ought to be able to find you know, some area there we haven't yet but uh, but hopefully uh, our leadership and we in conjunction with our leadership will do that um, Mr. Uh, Rowe let me uh, begin with you what specific forms of support uh, can uh, SBDCs that you're uh, you know intimately involved in and, and knowledgeable about obviously and other entrepreneurial uh, development centers uh, offer to small businesses during times of uh, uncertainty such as a government shutdown uh, it, it really depends on on the business mr. Shabbat if they're a federal contractor we can offer them some advice we we operate 29 of the 94 P tax procurement technical assistance centers and we can offer them some advice on you know, how to handle the loss of revenue and try and deal with it as, as Ms. Gerding did. Um, but honestly, we can't really tell them anything about what's going to happen in terms of the government coming back on. Mm -hmm. Now, with borrowers, the 7A and 504 lenders, um, they're stuck. They can't get approvals from SBA. Uh, and very often, the the very reason we've gone th with our clients through a 7A loan process or a 504 loan process is because they've exhausted the other options. Mm -hmm. So then we're we're trying to help them find bridge or alternative financing. Uh, very often, uh, you know, there's there's some limited ability to do that. Some of the folks in the 504 and 7A community have been really great about stepping up and finding ways to help the clients. 
Uh, but that's that's a limited resource. Yeah. Yeah. Let me move uh, Ms. Skirting. Ms. Skirting, um, I think you uh, uh, very very poignantly highlighted, um, you know, one of one of the most uh, uh, significant items that I think oftentimes got uh, ignored in the coverage of the shutdown, and that's it wasn't just government employees. You know, there was you sometimes hear cavalier statements about, oh well, these, you know, they're off for three weeks or two weeks and it's an unpaid vacation at this point, but they're going to get paid and that kind of thing. But the government contractors, the, the those employed by private entities, um, they oftentimes are going to get nothing back and literally we're receiving nothing. And you, you talked about that. Would, what would you like to comment about, about that and how it really affected real people that you, that you knew of? I think that the back pay situation is something that Congress should consider mm -hmm. reimbursing um, those contractors. I have all four of my contracts that were affected out of the 20 were firm fixed price contracts. Technically, I should be reimbursed at the end of the month for the work that was done or not done because I'm based on a firm fixed price. However, the acquisition workforce is new. And many of the people don't understand the regulations. And so there's been a lot of pushback in the past that if I have a vacancy or there's another presidential mandate because a, a former president died and there's a, a day that's off in this particular town that they're not going to reimburse us for those days because we didn't work. And so there's been a lot of education that's been tried to go back and forth with the acquisition officers. SEIC, I know, was reporting that for every week they were off, they were losing something like $10 million for every week. Certainly, we're not at that size, but I think that extrapolating our information to what they're experiencing it's a ripple effect across government contracting. Yeah. Um, if I if I could stop there because I've only got less than or about. Can a I just minute, say one minute. one quick thing is Real quick. just recognize them, just okay. acknowledge that we exist. I think that will go so far. Thank you very much, and Mr. Butcher. I'll, I'll, I've only got a short time here. Um, we passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, a while back, and uh, a lot of small businesses, individuals, a lot of folks benefited from that. Um, could you comment briefly on how your company has used uh, the savings in that, either to reinvest or for your employees or what, what you've done with it? Yes, the savings and when the, the excise tax was cut uh, last year, mm -hmm. um, we've used that savings to buy new tanks for our brewery. Uh, we've hired more people uh, at our brewery, uh, salespeople out in the field, and we've used that money to continue that savings to continue to grow our business. And it, uh, we also have installed a, a brand new bottling line um, that would not have been possible uh, without the excise tax being cut. Thank you very much. My time's expired, Madam Chair. The gentleman's time has expired, and the gentleman yield back. And the gentle lady from Iowa, Ms. Abby Finkenauer, who is the chair of the Subcommittee on Rural Development, Agricultural, Trade, and Entrepreneurship is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I just want to thank all of you today for being here and hearing from you. Uh, you know, I'm one of the freshmen that got sworn in in the middle of this shutdown. And Ms. Girding and Mr. Butcher, your testimony today underscores what I was hearing back in my district and also across the country that our working families and our small businesses should never be used as bargaining chips when it comes to policy decisions. Um, and Mr. Shapiro, uh, you underscored that not only is that bad for our values, it's also bad for our economy. And uh, I, I'm just, again, very grateful to, to have you all here today. And Mr. Rowe, I, I, I really appreciate your testimony. And one of the things you highlighted was, you know, small businesses, um, and for me, especially our farmers, hate uncertainty. And so this question, um, I'm hoping you can help me with here, here a bit. You know, uh, this shutdown has had serious impact on Iowa's workers and our farmers across the board. Uh, in my district, we heard from small businesses that couldn't afford their products or to have their products inspected and approved for sale, and from farmers who missed out on a key data and loan deadlines. Uh, this shutdown hurt Iowa's families and our farmers which are, quite frankly, the lifeblood of our economy in rural America. And on top of that, our farmers and workers are getting hit hard every single day from this trade war. 
Uh, in Iowa, nearly half of our employees work at small businesses, which are 99% of our businesses. From your different perspectives, and I know you all have many of them, but Mr. Rowe, again, I, I hope you can help me with this one. What could we do to help minimize the impact to our farmers, small businesses, and their employees in the case of another shutdown, which I hope we don't see? Uh, should we be looking at ideas on regulatory relief, waiving payment deadlines, or would a new short-term loan program make sense to minis uh, minimize disruptions? Uh, do you have any ideas of what we could be doing in the future here? Uh, because, uh, quite frankly, uh, we should never be put in this position again, uh, but I want to make sure that our small businesses and our farmers are taken care of. Thank you, Ms. Finkenauer. Um well, the easiest thing would be just to come to agreement and not have a shutdown. But honestly, you know, and we do deal with a lot of uh, value-added agriculture, rural businesses. While USDA inspections are considered mandatory, there's a bit of a gap sometimes. And I've heard this uh, actually from, from one of our clients in Texas, that there are USDA inspectors who don't have a company car so they can't get around to do the inspections unless they're spending their own money on gas um, and using their own car. Uh, I think one of the things USDA could look at is making sure that their inspection force is up and ready for everybody who's involved. I think the payment, waiving the payments, I'm... Um, if you don't have someone to make a payment to, I, you know, it's essentially waived. I don't understand how, how, that, how that system works, I admit. Um, as far as loans go, USDA's B&I loan program was shut down just like 504 and 7A at SBA. Uh, it's, it's the same problem there. The gentlelady uh, yields back, and now we recognize uh, Representative Troy, Troy Balderson, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Innovation and Workforce Development for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to say a few opening statements, as the ranking member also did, um, just to bring up a couple points. It's important uh, that we carefully consider the impacts that the federal government actions or inactions uh, have on the average American. Unfortunately, even a partial shutdown like the one we just experienced can be, have a detrimental impact on Ohioans and their small business. I have another solution. I have introduced a piece of legislation called End the Government Shutdowns Act, which will prevent small businesses from ever suffering again due to appropriations impasse. I thank the ranking member for his co-sponsorship and support on this important piece of legislation. Today, I plan to listen to these folks at the witness table who have so graciously volunteered their time so I may learn from your experiences. I hope my colleagues on both sides of this dais will join me in finding solutions for small businesses, the heart of our economy, and I invite my colleagues to co-sponsor the End Government Shutdown Act. My first question is directed to Mr. Rowe. Uh, do you believe the continued operation of programs such as the 7A504 and microloan programs is critical? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Uh, the, the whole point to the 7A and 504 programs, and I worked as committee counsel, as, as Mr. Shabbat pointed out, the whole point uh, to these programs is to provide assistance to solid small businesses that haven't been able to access the financing they need in the private sector. Thank you. Question from Ms. Skirting. I appreciate you sharing your insight on the difference between the treatment of federal contractors and federal employees. I had that situation in my district and I myself said the same thing. Uh, there are other folks out there that are being affected by this that the conversation is not happening with. Uh, could you elaborate on how partial lapse in appropriations uh, impacts affect the contractors differently? The first point I'll make is the recognition. Um, you know, just the fact that we're not even being recognized at the table, I think a lot of our employees feel not valued and that their work isn't important. As I hear the others 
speakers here testify about not having gas money and things like that, my head goes to are these government contractors, which leads to a whole different discussion on how contracts are being bid and won on low cost, technically acceptable. So maybe whoever bid this contract didn't put that in there to save money and so, but the public doesn't know that their government contractors may be performing. So it's a whole nother discussion. But um, I think the other thing is the indirect costs that are associated with this. Many of my customers are uneducated in how government contracting is, is bid. And they don't recognize the fact that when I pay somebody $50,000 an hour, they think that, they're, that, that I should charge them $50,000 an hour. They don't consider the overhead, the indirect expenses associated with running the business. So oftentimes I'm having to educate my customers about that whole process, which is maddening sometimes because they think if I'm charging $75 an hour to the government, but I'm only paying the employee $50 an hour, that $25 is profit going in my pocket, when in fact it's not. It's paying for health insurance. It's paying for, for um, you know, all the other insurances and fringe that I'm covering. I'm paying for the other staff that's supporting the company, the payroll people, the CFO, the chief operating officer, other things, just to keep the business running. So I think there's a big big disconnect right there is that the government contractors, it impacts more than just the employee, it affects those that are indirectly supporting the company as well. I agree. Thank you for your answer. Dr. Shapiro, would you agree that preventing government shutdowns from occurring altogether would provide more certainty for small businesses and the American economy? Uh, yes, I would agree with that. Thank you. I yield back the rest of my time, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back, and now we'll recognize uh, the gentle lady from Kansas, Ms. David, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Ms. Garding, I'm going to start with you because uh, in Kansas, like in a lot of places, there are a lot of federal employees, but also a lot of federal contractors, specifically in my district. In fact, in Overland Park, there are a lot of um, government contractors um, and all over my district. And yesterday I spoke with the owner of Veracity, also a woman-owned business, and she, like there, if the similarities between what I'm hearing from you today and what I heard from her yesterday um, are stark and highlight that although these are anecdotal, that it is across the board we're seeing similar outcomes. Um, I mean, in January alone yesterday, she told me that she lost $135,000 in her business and um, continued to pay employees, although, um, you know, she wasn't sure, the uncertainty that we've heard about, wasn't sure when, when her contracts would pick back up, which leads me to a question about retention, employee retention, the concern about being able to attract high high skilled um, quality employees both as federal civil service but also in in these very important contracting um, companies can you tell me a bit about your concern um, what you look at what your outlook for not just attracting but also retaining the people who are um, in your company now so thank you for um, acknowledging Overland Park. Um, we actually supported the National Benefit Center out there for many, many years in Overland Park and Lee Summit, Missouri. In fact, I have staff still emailing me and, and texting me regularly asking me to bid on the contract and please come back to work. So you may see me again. Um, in response to your question, retention was a problem during this shutdown. I had one employee resign as a result of the fact that he was new to government contracting and just thought it was too risky for his family. I will say that because I'm fortunate and come from the Washington DC area, it's not as big a concern. Um, the one thing that government contracting is, is it won't make you rich, but you're assured of getting paid. <laughs> um, whereas other commercial businesses don't have that same benefit. So in terms of retention, I think that high tech services won a lot of brownie points, if you will, with the fact that we put people back on the payroll. Um, Another shutdown, I'm not sure that I'll be able to do that. In fact, the first thing I thought was when some of my employees said, well, you put those people back on the payroll, so I wasn't concerned. I thought, yeah, but I don't know that I could support 160 people on the payroll for a long period of time. So I didn't tell them that, but that's what I thought. Um, so I, I'm not sure it has a big impact. I think that federal contracting is still a very secure place to be. Uh, I appreciate that. And then just a quick follow-up or... Um, 
it's not a follow up directly to that question, but something that you mentioned earlier, which is uh, education of the customers that you're servicing in the the procurement process and what specifics are in and the terms of of the contracts that you're filling. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Who when when you talk about the customers, who exactly in um, in the negotiation of that are you are you talking about? So it's everywhere from the contracting officer's representative, the technical person in the federal agency that we're actually doing the work for, all the way through the acquisition officer, the contracting officer. It just varies as to the level of experience and support. So you never know when you're talking, you know, you're talking to your contracting officer's representative on the technical side about the way things should be done, they call the contracting officer and we're, we're sure that the contracting officer is going to support us by saying it's a fixed price contract, pay them. Instead they say, oh no, 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 you had vacancies on the contract and we're like, oh my gosh, so I'm going to my attorney. I'm incurring a lot of out of pocket expenses to try to figure out how to get back there without ruining my reputation with the customer or the contracting officer because I don't wanna be seen as a difficult customer. So um, it's just, I think, time and education. I'm low on time, so I'm not sure if you can give me a yes or no here. But what I'm, what I, what I feel like I'm hearing is that uh, even in our procurement process, there is a lot of education that needs to be done on yes. the federal civil service side uh, around around contracts like yours and probably others. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentle lady yields back, and uh, the gentleman, Mr. Kevin Hearn ranking member of the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Tax, and Capital Access is recognized for five minutes from Oklahoma. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, in true bipartisan fashion, I truly appreciate you removing the President's name from the original title of the hearing today. Uh, as we all know, we this in true government fashion, we're talking about government shutdowns that have been occurring regularly for almost 40 years now. So. Today, we're probably not going to solve the problem, but I think it really begs to understand why we have them. As a business person, as a person that's been in small business for 34 years, has been signing his paycheck on both sides for over 25 years, I certainly will be the first to acknowledge that anything that disrupts the uh, normal process of competing with each other as opposed to competing with the federal government's regulations, overburdensome taxation, um, it is a problem that when we have something as extraordinary as a shutdown, regardless of who na whose name is on the front of it or why it was caused. Quite frankly, uh, many people, and one of the reasons I'm here is because uh, we seem to can't do our job up here of just passing something as simple as the 12 appropriation bills. We would not be talking about shutdowns again. So we can introduce all kinds of new legislation. We should just do introduce a new legislation, which I've signed on to, which is no budget, budget no recess don't have to have a constitutional amendment. You do not go home till it gets passed. We will not even have these hearings anymore because we will all be getting paid in regular order and this will be a whole different place to live and breathe in. I know my business friends certainly would appreciate that and Dr. Shapiro, there'll probably be less to talk about uh, in your world, but uh, I really appreciate that. Mr. Rowe, um, as someone who is highly involved in America's small businesses and you see a lot of different uh, industries, I have a question for you. If you remember, since we're talking about what causes shutdowns and more importantly, what causes the enthusiasm in small businesses or not, um, could you describe, based on your thousands of businesses that you're touching, what drove the enthusiasm so highly, so quickly uh, in November 2016? About 14 point jump in enthusiasm um, on November 2016, according to NFIB. No, we the the small business community um, was very enthused by the passage of the Tax Act. They thought things were going very well. Um, as a result, we saw you know increased economic activity and involvement. Um, I think the the biggest problem we had is, have now is that we had all that increased activity, and a fair amount of it flows through the SBA's loan so, program. So, uh, Mr. Rowe, if I may, um, back in 2016, not 2018. Oh, 2016. Yeah. Oh, geez. It happened to be an election year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, what enthuses people? Uh, you know, Mr. Hearn, I'm going to be honest and tell you that I think you know, people are always seeking change in an election year. And I think that's what they wanted, and that's what they got. Um, 
I think they were a little bit frustrated, particularly in the small business community, what, with what they consider to be a low growth economy. Um, if I may, just as a, just to fast forward that, um, with the change in 2018 November election, there was a decline in, in small business enthusiasm, almost coinciding with an election, coincidentally, or not. Um, but as we go forward here, I just, I just want to ask you, I really appreciate certainly the two business people at the table talking about uh, what we should do, because I think that's what business people do. They look at the problem, and they try to find an agreement or a solution how to move forward. And you're asking of us as members of Congress to stop this madness of repeating history time and time again. It's insanity. Uh, the two gentlemen on each end are describing what happens when you have these disruptions. And so the combination of all the testimony here is very, you know, it's very important for us all to listen to and for us to take back up our members, because if we truly care about 70 percent of the job creation in America, we truly care about big businesses, growth in the future, because they are our small businesses are incubators for large businesses in the future. You, you think that would be the most important thing in the world to drive this economy. This economy is founded on job creation and business. You would think that we would take that back and we would vote accordingly to drive that economic engine. But you see quite the difference in that. And we're talking, again, imminent shutdown over other things that drive you know, policy. So we've got to determine what's the most important thing that we're all going to work on in the small business and take back up to our respective leaderships to move it forward. I'll remind us all the greatest social program in the world is a job. And there are two job creators up there. Uh, I'm one as well. So I appreciate your testimony, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. And now I recognize uh, Mr. Jerry Golden uh, from, uh, he's the chairman of the Subcommittee on Contracting and Infrastructure from Maine, the great state of Maine. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, first, first thing I want to say is, is to Ms. Girding, um, you know, coming out of the Marines and, and seeing your background in the Navy, I am not surprised to hear uh, that just a couple weeks into this, you uh, and the people that, that help you run your business instinctually knew that you had to do something to help take care of your workers, so you, you put them back on the payroll. Uh, one of the things that uh, this shutdown, I think, uh, impressed upon me in my first few weeks in Congress is that when we fail to provide that kind of leadership here in Congress, uh, that's one of the embarrassing you know, things about it is people like you have to step up and, and fill that leadership gap. And uh, I think that's also one of the positives is we, we, we see that we've got people like you out there running businesses and, and taking care of workers. So thank you very much for that. Um, you know, in looking here at your, at your testimony, there's a bullet here about financial impact to business. And you noted here that you're operating off a you know, budget that's predicated on an expected budget. And you noted a uh, deficit in indirect expenses of about $100,000. Now, my, my folks back home run a small business. It's not as big as yours. It's very small. Uh, $100,000 would be a lot. I don't know what the impact is to you, but I'm wondering if you could just tell us a few things about, um, you know, relevant to steps you might have to take to try and get your budget back on track. So we've already taken a look at that. Um, the budget last year was, when we developed 2019's budget, was based on a $16.5 million revenue stream. Um, from that, what we did was we had to reduce that to $16.25 million. About a quarter of a million dollars came out of our budget because the revenue is going to be lost from the company, which means we had to go back into all of our indirect expenses and realize where we were going to reduce costs. I still am assessing the impact right now because we did have to go into our line of credit to use, especially at the beginning of the year when we're pay, you know, paying full amounts of FUDA and SUDA and, and all those other things that hit you at the beginning of the year. Plus, you have short months, you know, 28 days in February, et cetera. And then there's a number of federal holidays that hit at the beginning of the year. So we, we will have to sharpen our pencils and reduce our costs throughout the company to make sure that we come in on budget, which we will do but it does have an impact on everyone across the board. Thank you. So there's some short-term steps that you're going to have to take. We're there. already taking on, now, on, yes. on a longer term, I, 
talked to a, a constituent back home who, who runs a, a business and contracts with the federal government. They noted that during the shutdown, GSA wasn't posting uh, any solicitations for bids. I don't know if that's something that you also uh, had to deal with during this, but can you talk a little bit about how that might impact either yourself or a business like the one I'm noting back home in, in Maine in terms of their long-term uh, confidence in, in business planning? Uh, to, to deal with the fact that there's no solic solicitation for work for them to be competing for during a shutdown. So that gets in, I mean, there is an impact based on the shutdown. There's bigger impacts that impact the small business community that are successful and grow outside their size standards. And now all of a sudden they're playing with the big guys, but they're only a, let's say, a $40 million company. And now all of a sudden I'm having to compete with Lockheed Martin. Um, with the government going to category management, if you don't have one of those contract vehicles, you're, you're not going to play. You'll always be a subcontractor to a large contractor. And then you're at their mercy to play whatever game they want to play. Um, when I get a teaming agreement, I'm looking at it saying, this is unfair. I want that if you get the option year, I get the option year. And they said, look, either take it or I'll find another company that wants to do the work. So I'm forced to kind of negotiate like that. Um, in terms of the shutdown itself, we weren't adversely affected by the proposal process. What I was anecdotally dis uh, told from another company was that the acquisition office was needing approval from another government agency. So it was a Department of Defense agency that needed approval from another federal agency that was closed. That shut the acquisition process down because that agency wasn't open. So that's going to slow roll that procurement and move it to the right. All right. Thank you. Well, one last question, shifting gears, uh, Dr. Shapiro. I'm just looking here at, at some data. Um, this is Vistage Worldwide, who did some work with Wall Street Journal. Uh, they were making note that uh, in, in 2018, economic confidence among smaller firms edged actually downward. 14% uh, of firms expected the economy to improve uh, in 19, but 36% expected it to get worse. Uh, could you just talk a, a little bit about how something like a shutdown in the month of January might add to that kind of downward uh, confidence among small firms in particular? I don't, I don't think we have direct evidence that, that – uh, that that survey was affected by the conference, but but I I, I think for all the reasons that we're we're hearing, uh, it's very hard to know how to plan. It's very hard to know whether to hire a worker. It's very hard to know whether to d develop a new brew uh, if 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 the if the government's not going to work and you, and and business depends on that. So I can well imagine that uh, uh, at ma many businesses, confidence is affected. Thank you. The gentleman yields back and now recognize Mr. Hagedorn from Minnesota for five minutes. Madam Chair, thank you for the time. Uh, appreciate the leadership that you and the ranking member have shown on this and uh, all your past work on this committee. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, helping our Main Street businesses and small businesses is certainly very important to the First District of Minnesota and all the people across the country. It's the small businesses, the job creating backbone of our economy. And I appreciate the testimony of the, of the folks here. I'd like to say to uh, Ms. Gerding, I appreciate you coming up. It was nice to meet you before the hearing. As a fellow Minnesotan, welcome. And I think that Congressman Oberstar, when he nominated you to the Naval Academy, knew what he was doing. And congratulations on that. And thank you for your service to our country. Uh, I've heard a lot from the witnesses about certainty. And obviously, uh, when the federal government shuts down, uh, that's not a good thing for you. It's not a good thing for anyone. And we, we can debate on why that happens and so forth and what should happen in the future. Uh, that is, I suppose, the ultimate thing that in your, your line of work that uh, we can do to create certainties to make sure we don't shut down anymore. I get that. But uh, when you look at the federal government and its impact on small business and our economy, there are lots of ways that the government can throw a wrench in things and have a lot of uncertainty across the board. I think... Uh, what my friend uh, Mr. Hearn was getting at is before uh, the 2016 election, there might have been a little bit of uncertainty on regulatory policy, whether or not we were going to have something like Waters of the United States or the Clean Power Plan, things like that, uh, would drive businesses to maybe look at things different and uh, take a step back as to whether or not they were going to move forward. Uh, taxation, obviously, energy policies, uh, labor, trade, you can go on down the line. I'll, I'll st I'm drawn to the, to the brewer in the bunch, uh, so I'll say to Mr. Butcher, uh, how does certainty play and uncertainty, and uh, what are you looking for from the federal government, the executive and legislative branch moving forward in general? Well, thank you, Mr. Hagedorn. As far as certainty goes, um, 
in, in founding a small business and running a small business, you start up in an environment of uncertainty. Uh, you don't know, um, you don't know exactly how things are going to go, uh, but you have to go with your gut and you have to do uh, the best job you can every single day. Um, as far as the government giving us more of a level of certainty, um, we're in a highly regulated industry. And I accepted that when we decided to get into the brewing industry. Uh, we are regulated by the TTB at the federal level. Uh, we're regulated by the FDA at the federal level as well. And so we accept that. Um, but in order for us to function and introduce our new beers and keep our innovation pipeline alive, uh, we need those services to be available. Um, unfortunately, the only aspect of the TTB that was operating was uh, they were taking our checks and cashing our checks. <laughs> so, um, but as far as certainty goes, by having the government running, by enabling the TTB to allow us to perform our basic business function, um, at the very least, would provide a, a better level of certainty. Sure. And uh, I would say, obviously, we want your businesses to expand and you to be successful, but we want other enterprises to be created. And people have ideas right now that they're thinking about and it's important for the government to have consistent policies so they can go to the community banks and others to get the loans needed in order to be able to show them the case that, yeah, this is what they're going to spend and these are going to be the costs for health care and everything else. And down the road, this is how they're going to pay it back and expand their businesses and be successful. So with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Now we recognize Mr. Mac Vizi from Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how much money the federal government lost and our economy lost because of the uh, prolonged shutdown. Um, I believe the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, Dr. Shapiro, estimated that the cost of the shutdown uh, of money that we will never uh, get back ended up being about uh, $2.3 billion. Does, does that seem right to you? Yeah, that's a reasonable ballpark. The, Cong the Congressional Budget Office has estimated the uh, your, your, the effect on GDP for the year about one tenth of one percent of GDP. But the GDP is a big number, so that so it does add up. One of the things the president talked about last night during the State of the Union was the economy. Uh, he touted the economy, talked about uh, job numbers, uh, talked about uh, how we're experiencing growth. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, we're about to reach another government shutdown uh, here soon if a deal is not reached, uh, 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 February the 15th. Uh, in your opinion, if we do not reach a long-term deal, uh, what would an additional prolonged government shutdown mean uh, for uh, not just Q1, but for overall economic activity this year? Well, I think it'd be useful to dial back to how it felt uh, the, 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 week, the week the shutdown was resolved, uh, where not only were uh, businesses and uh, individuals directly affected uh, cutting back, uh, it looked like the air transport system was, was getting tenuous, and that, that's very bad for a whole range of businesses. So uh, all of the, we're, we're, hearing, we're, we're hearing myriad details of how the federal government uh, 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 make makes the economy run run better. Granted, regulation is a is a burden, but also uh, there, there are benefits to regulation. The uh, th there's a reason why uh, breweries have to take their labels to the government. Uh, they the the public expects that the what's in the beer will be uh, there, and and we have food and, and safety inspectors who 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 verify that. So there's really a partnership between business and the government. And if that appears to be breaking down, I think the, there'll be substantial risk of indirect effects that could be very significant for the economy. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And I wanted to ask Ms. Uh, Girding, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about small contractors. And I know in the district that I represent that there are just so many hurdles uh, to uh, people that are trying to start up a, a, a small business, people that own small businesses, uh, and delayed pay, uh, working on projects and, and, and not being paid uh, in, a, in a prompt manner and how it can be a lot harder to find that uh, capital to continue operating your business without that flow of income coming in. Uh, and, I also, and I wanted to hear um, 
what how how did your company manage through the shutdown after not uh, receiving uh, payments? I, I'd be very curious about how that how how you were able to to work through that. So we haven't seen the impact yet because the shutdown occurred in December and January. Okay. So um, I do have lines of credit in place. I will say to your initial part of your question that starting a business is not for the faint of heart. And I have a lot of people, because I do a lot of public speaking, that come up to me afterwards and say, I want to be just like you. Um, how can I get my business going? What's your advice? And I said, are you currently working now? And their response is, yes. I said, stop working. Well, how will I take care of myself? I said, that's what you're going to experience as a business owner. I said, if you don't have enough money put away for 12 months to live on, you shouldn't start a business. Because as long as you're working, you're not focusing on growing your business. You can't do both things, especially in federal contracting. Your customers are there during the day, not in the evening. And so you need to be out there in their face during the day. So, you know... I anticipate a lot of these things that happen. I don't like to consider myself a victim by these circumstances, so we, we have to plan for these events. I'm not happy about them. It erodes my profit, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, our mission statement in my company is that we help the government keep Americans safe because of the work we do, and that's really what drives my, my workforce. They're not highly paid employees. Many of them are serv service contract act employees that make minimum wage. And when I ask them why they get up and come to work every day, especially in places like Lee Summit, Missouri, supporting the National Benefits Center for Immigration, it's because, Mrs. Gerding, I'm helping keep American, or Americans safe because I'm keeping terrorists out of this country. And I'm thinking, you open the mail. But they feel such a connection to what they're doing every day that that's what brings them to work. So I think that there has to be something other than the money. People have to be prepared for these events if you're going to be in government contracting. Thank you very much. The Madam gentleman's Chair. time has expired, and now we recognize the gentleman from Florida, uh, Mr. Spano, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, ranking member, appreciate your leadership and look forward to serving under it these next two years. Um, I uh, am grateful for each of you that have come and offered your expertise and, and uh, testimony. Um, I am, as was mentioned earlier, a small business owner as well and have owned my own business for over a decade now. And frankly, it's one of the things, the challenges that I was encountering as a small business owner was one of the things that really prompted me to run for office, um, to seek office uh, as a member of the State House because I really did not feel like government was really uh, had my back. The government really cared about small business. Um, there was a lot of lip service being paid to small business, um, but there really wasn't a whole lot being done to help. And so I'm glad to, for what the Small Business Administration has done, for what this committee has done in that regard, and look forward to serving you uh, in an effort to help small business moving forward. I'm trying to get a handle around, and maybe it was offered before I walked in as testimony, but I'm not sure who, who among you uh, would be willing to offer your, uh, your testimony on this, maybe Mr. Rowe uh, potentially, but the, the percentage of small, business, small businesses that actually directly contract uh, with the federal, federal government and or have subcontracts all right, that are directly impacted by government shutdown. Well, Mr. Spano, I'm going to just quickly rely on some stuff, uh, some information I got from my friends at the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I serve on their Small Business Council. Um, what what they what they put together, working with uh, Bloomberg.gov, was an analysis of agency spending data. They found 41. 1,107 small business contractors and $2.35 billion in contracts at risk during the shutdown. Um, and I've got, I can give you this, I'm happy to. It's got breakdown state by state. In Florida, there were 2,359 contractors, small business contractors. And, and thank you for that information. I guess what I'm looking for is a comparison. I understand the numbers that have been offered, the total projected uh, impact, but vis-a-vis -vis those small businesses that do not have direct or even indirect contact with the government in terms of contracting, what are we looking at in terms of percentages? Well, if you look at the Office of Advocacy, I think their numbers say there are around 27 million small businesses in the United States, but um, I think if you look at 
small businesses with employees, it's probably closer to eight million. Okay, and I'm not. I didn't major in math. That's why I became an attorney. So, okay. and just in my head, I'm trying to figure out what, what what percentage that is. But it seems like it. Obviously, not to minimize the impact, but it does seem like a fairly small percentage. Uh, one of the things that I do and have done in the last six years as a member of the Florida House, uh, and I'm sure we'll be doing it here as well, is to balance competing policy interests. Right? There's usually an argument to be made on both sides. Um, and sometimes you can usually make pretty good arguments on both sides, but you try and do the best you can to weigh those interests and then come down on what you feel like is the best uh, thing to do. One of the things that uh, I would be interested to hear about um, at some point, Madam Chair, uh, in the next uh, maybe few months is the impact that um, illegal immigration potentially has on small businesses, um, the uncertainty that um, our inability to come to some uh, long-term uh, agreement on immigration reform. Uh, I'd love to hear the impact that that has on small business because um, obviously uh, that's an issue as well. And, and it certainly, we're not gonna, um, any of us disagree that that is an issue that is of concern that has at least in part caused the shutdown. And so it would help be helpful for me to understand the impact of that issue on small business and uh, whether or not that interest and the small business community's interest, um, the impact that it may have on them outweighs the potential interest um, that is served by having certainty with regard to uh, continued government. Do you, do you follow my line of questioning? Um, and so I guess uh, I've got 24 seconds here, but I guess would you acknowledge that that is an issue of potential concern, the uncertainty that illegal, illegal immigration causes, and it would, would it not be a great idea to have uh, uh, an idea, at least from the small business community, of how that impacts our policymaking decisions? I, I, I would never say that there is not a impact from that. Um, one of our SBDCs testified uh, last Congress uh, from Mr. Shabbat on the impact that opioid awareness and the opioid crisis is having on small business. Um, all of these things add up. Um, and I think there are indirect impacts on a shutdown that come beyond the contractors and the subcontractors if you just look at, well, all of the restaurants and other businesses that might surround a federal facility, you'd be amazed at, you know, how many lunches at a large contracting facility, if you've got a restaurant next to it, that you're missing for three weeks. That's a big chunk of their business. Uh, it's, it's all a, you know, big interconnected ecosystem. Thank the gentleman. <clears throat> I'd like to, um, I am temporarily filling in for the, the chairperson. As you can see, I'm not the chair chairwoman. However, uh, I want to make sure that uh, I ask questions myself. I limit myself five minutes to ask questions. Uh, what I'd like to do is start off with um, a question that, that I believe uh, is a discussion that's taking place right now in the Ways and Means Committee. Um, you know, I'm honored to be on that committee. And that committee's holding a hearing today to focus on improving retirement savings for American workers. One thing I've been hearing that many workers are not offered a retirement saving plans through private employers. Around 2 million people in my home state of Pennsylvania do not have access to a retirement plan through the employer. That is especially true for employees of small businesses due to obstacles these businesses often face in being able to provide employer benefits. Ms. Gerber, in your written testimony, you discussed some of the financial impacts of the shutdown on your workforce. Can you explain how the shutdown impacted benefits, small, benefits small businesses offer to employees like retirement plans? So we do offer a retirement plan. In fact, if you're gonna be a government contractor to keep up with your, your competition, you need to have some sort of benefits package. The really small companies, maybe not, but as you start to do more and more work with the federal government, you really need to have one. In our particular case, my concern that we're trying to pull numbers around is, if an employee did not draw a salary during the shutdown, what did they lose in 401k contributions that they might have had coming out of their paycheck? And then what was the match that they lost that our company would have provided? 
Um, we had a couple of people who had garnishments in their paychecks. So when we started talking about this with my HR person, what came to light was that they were going to have a reduced paycheck anyway. So let's say they were going to get $1,500 for a pay period. All of a sudden now, because of the government shutdown, they took leave without pay, it's now maybe $750. They now have a garnishment pulled out of that. They now have flexible spending. So we upfront the cost in their flexible spending accounts at the beginning of the year, let's say $2,500. In January, they may have had something that they went to the doctors for. So the first thing we're going to do before we pay them is pull that money out of their account. So now when they're expecting about a $750 check, they're really only going to get, let's say, $350. So we're trying to assess the costs of that right now and what the impact is. But the biggest one that I can think of in terms of benefits is flexible spending. I was concerned about health care because our SCA employees contribute through their health, health and welfare benefit that the Department of Labor under the Service Contract Act required that we pay. If an employee took leave without pay, they were not entitled to the health and welfare benefit. Those people, the company paid for their health care during that shutdown period when they were leave without pay. So no one went without in terms of health care benefits. And there's no discussion right now to pull that money back out of their pay. So health care a little bit, although no one was adversely affected. And 401k, which no one has brought to my attention either, um, I'm always concerned about being an older person. I want to make sure that the young people are looking towards the future and that they're 401k and don't miss that match that the company is giving you. So... Thank you. Mr. Rowe, um, the agriculture in industry, which is critical to my home state of Pennsylvania, in total put agriculture contributing near seven, $75 billion to our state economy. Our ability to explore and promote our products in the global market is critical to not only our economy, but obviously the livelihood of the individuals. In your written testimony, you highlight the challenges some of your clients face when attempting to explore goods and services. Can you elaborate on that, please? And what impact does does this have on the ability of our small businesses to rank, uh, remain competitive abroad? Yeah, when when there's when there's a shutdown, um, you you lose access to the um, Census Bureau's assistance on regulations um, and information. You lose the Commerce Department's support, the International Trade Administration's support. Um, our um, small business development centers, a lot of whom uh, in Pennsylvania and other states uh, form a bit of a backbone for the state's export program. Um, you know, and then we're kind of fighting for the small business with one hand tied behind our back at that point. Mm -hmm. I yield back to balance my time. And the next person who has questions. I think this will be the first time on the Small Business Committee, a brand new gentleman from the great state of New York, Mr. Doug Allo. have five minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, really uh, exciting to be here. And thank each and every one of you for uh, your testimony uh, uh, and for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Um, I did want to, as I heard one of my colleagues speak about uh, competing interests and how there could be valid positions on either side, uh, I would be remiss to not make the point that it's hard to uh, have those interests compete uh, in the absence of an open government. Um, that is the role. Um, and so I would just encourage all of my colleagues to understand that we need government for interests to compete. Otherwise, uh, what are we doing? Um, and for that reason, uh, it is simply inexcusable that we found ourselves uh, in this position. Uh, and as members of this body, uh, we can't let us get there again. Um, now, over the past 34 days, um, I've held three public town halls and met with folks back home uh, who are farmers and contractors, uh, contractors and small business owners. We have over 27,000 um, uh, in my district. Uh, and uh, Mr. Butcher, I would also note that uh, my district has one of the, the most breweries uh, in, in the country. Um, the impact is uh, unnecessary, obviously, of the shutdown. Uh, and in fact, one of our local cideries received a value-added production grant uh, from the USDA, uh, but they could not receive their reimbursement for the equipment they purchased during the shutdown. Uh, other farmers in my district are highly concerned about the H-2B uh, visa program and that migrant farmers will be arriving a month later uh, than expected. This shutdown has created uncertainty, as discussed, and frustration from many in my district 
who are working hard to make ends meet. I think we've all heard the statistics, 78% of folks in this country living paycheck to paycheck, you miss a check, it's gonna hurt. Um, it is simply unacceptable that we find ourselves in this position. So my question is uh, for you, Mr. Butcher. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the deep supply chain that brewers uh, rely on. Uh, can you talk about how the shutdown has affected the brewers and farmers uh, you work with, and what would happen if the government shut down, shuts down uh, again uh, at the end of this week? Thank you, Mr. Delgado. Um, yeah, our supply chain obviously is crucial um, to our business. We rely on our farmers. We work closely with them. Uh, we work directly with a wheat farmer in, um, in the northern neck of Virginia. And we plan with them our production schedule. And they plant their crops according to what our needs are. And we're fortunate to have um, a farmer who is able to work with us and who's able to scale up with us and to continue to help us grow our business. Um, and if we're not able to buy that grain because we can't get our label approved because the TTB is shut down, it directly affects their small family farm as well. So they take this grain that they've grown for us and they have to figure out what to do with it. Do they send it to a malting house uh, and try to find another buyer for it? Are they going to um, downgrade it and sell it as animal feed and make a much lower uh, sale price on it, or are they just going to lose that business altogether? We also contract two and three years out with our hop farmers. Um, and these are farms in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they're farms um, mainly in the Pacific Northwest, but we, we have to work with them two and three years out uh, to uh, plan our purchases of hops. And they also are putting the hops in the ground that we want to buy uh, a year from now and two years from now. So there's long-term planning that goes goes on. Um, uh, and like I said, the last four months of the year, we spent with our sales and marketing and our production team planning out uh, the brewing schedule, planning out our new release schedule, and planning out our supply chain uh, purchases as well. Uh, so that's really how it affects upstream uh, with our farmers and with our, uh, with our suppliers. Thank you. That was very helpful. I yield back the rest of my time. I thank the gentleman. The next uh, gentleman, I'd like to, um, Mr. Kim, who's the chairman of the subcommittee on economic growth, tax, and capital access. I want to let you know that I was the ranking member for that, so you see why I'm today as a result of that. <laughs> so you have some good, you'll have some good advice for me. I have to. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Kim. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and thank you so much for coming in and sharing your thoughts and wisdom with us. Um, you know, my district is very much a, a small business district in New Jersey. It stretches from the Delaware River to the Jersey Shore. And, uh, you know, this is an area where I constantly hear from people about their concerns. And, and similar to my colleague, you know, having a town hall, hearing about just the uh, difficulties with dealing with that political uncertainty. And I think for me, I come at this from an angle. I've been a public servant my whole career. I've been on the foreign policy side. Coming into this, there's a lot that I need to learn. I try to come into this job with a certain amount of humility to understand what it is it that we can be able to provide. So when I am asked those types of questions at a town hall from a small business owner asking me, well, you know, what advice do you have for me on, on how I can best position my business going forward for these types of political uncertainties, whether that's government shutdowns or other problems, um, I, w I wanted to ask that question to this panel here and, and just uh, get your collective thoughts on, on what is it that I can do to pass that message back? What should I be telling uh, small business owners in my district on, on how best they can try to weather some of those uncertainties going forward? I'll open that up to any, anyone who wants to jump in. So my advice is planning um, for a crisis. I think that every company should go through those exercises, whether they're, you know, a cybersecurity attack yep. or a financial impact that hits the business um, and how you're going to handle those things. If it's not a line of credit that you have in place and worked out a good relationship with your bank so that if you miss your covenants on that line, they understand, especially if you're in federal contracting, um, you really need to exercise and plan those events. That's the only way that we would get through that. Uh, as a small business owner, um, when we were opening this small business, um, my wife's advice to me um, as we were planning was to not just have a plan B, but always love your plan B. Um, in a situation like this, it's not really, um, you know, we've been at a loss. Well, what, what are we going to do? And it's hard to put together a plan B 
um, when the basic functions of the regulators that you rely on are just not open for business. So um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of answers. We're still waiting to hear back from the agencies now that they're reopened. Um, but I guess my advice would be um, to find a way to keep the government functioning. Uh, go ahead. I, I want to add one more thing. There's something that my company tracks called um, um, the Z-score. It's a Z-score. And, and we evaluate our performance at the end of every month based on our Z-score. And what that is is a combination of looking at different financial factors and what the backlog in terms of how much money I have if, if everything were to stop in my business today, how long can I sustain my business? And if, if business owners, small business owners, aren't looking at those kind of numbers and have three, four, five months of reserves ready to go, they're in a, a bad situation. Now, government contracting is pretty stable, but then you have these moments like this that are unpredictable. So when we look at our numbers and we do a financial analysis at the end of every month, that's one number that I focus on is how many months could I operate if nothing was paid. Um, so I think that's something business owners need to start looking at is those numbers. No, that's right. I mean, this is helpful. I mean, first of all, it's, it's just an unnecessary burden that is placed on small businesses for having to deal with uh, the failures of, of, of Washington to be able to get their house in order. And I think uh, not only is it unpredictable in terms of timing, but it's also unpredictable in terms of what services will be uh, closed and which ones will be open. And, you know, that uh, that is uh, constantly difficult, especially when you know, what I heard is uh, small business owners that are telling me they don't have the time to keep track of everything that's happening and the political discussions about, you know, what's going to stay open and what's not. And, and uh, you know, that they were trying to see, you know, what my office might be able to provide to try to help with some of that clarity. Uh, I'm certainly interested in what the committee, this committee and, and other institutions in our government can be done so that every small business owner themselves doesn't have to go out there and, and dig that information up, um, you know, every time that there's uh, some moment of potential political political instability. Um, so that planning and that kind of information is, is key. Can I say one more thing? Industry associations solve that problem for me. Yeah. I belong to the Professional Services Council, the Mid-Tier Advocacy, Advocacy Group, and the National Veteran Small Business Organization. All three of those groups are focused on government contracting. It is difficult to stay on top of every regulation that is passed up in, in, on the Hill here. What happens is they synthesize it and they they force feed it to me the in things that I need to know about on a regular basis. So that might be something they want to consider is join a professional organization that will keep them apprised, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce or an industry association, so that they don't have to try to stay atop of what's going on up here. I appreciate that. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to thank all of the witnesses for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, your comments were very helpful. It is clear from the testimony today that the government shutdown had dire economic and real-world consequences on our small businesses, the SBA, and our workforce. As we look towards the next looming deadline, I hope we can all remember what we heard today and work quickly to find a long-term solution. I would ask for unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record without objection to order. If there's no further business to come before this committee, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.